no comment about <laughs> We just start. Is this on? It is. Okay, great. Um, hi, mm -hmm. I'm Min. I'm moderating the conversation tonight, um, and I am really thrilled to be here with this group. It's um, an extremely interdisciplinary group. We have Nisi, who's a sci-fi writer. Um, we have Nick and Jason, who both write about um, leftist strategies, automation, accelerationism, and Jason, you write a little bit about aesthetics and right. philosophy as well. So. It's, it's such a rare, unique panel, and I really wanted to um, take advantage of this energy and have like a conversation that spans across all the disciplines and all the knowledges that you have, and also not make it too general, because that wouldn't be too helpful. So I tried to craft questions that touch at everything that you all do, um, and a thread I saw immediately was, you all work around this idea of utopias, um, in science fiction, obviously, that's a huge potent premise. In political strategizing, that's also a huge premise. So my first questions are about um, the idea of utopia and luxury. Um, and I know we're using luxury for all really generally, um, and I really like that, but it comes from a pretty specific um, political line of thought. So maybe you two can talk about that too. But my first question is, um, could you each spend a moment defining luxury as it relates to societal utopia? Um, wow, luxury is um, not having to worry about um, what's going to happen next. Like, am I going to be able to pay my rent? Because you don't have rent, because you don't have to pay rent. Um, luxury is uh, an, a very experiential thing for me. Um, it's uh, it's a fleeting thing for me at this moment, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Experiential, fleeting, and uh, very specific lack of want. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think um, there's also a distinction uh, worth making when it comes to luxury, which is there are certain types of luxury which are uh, dependent upon a sort of a, a status of hierarchy. Um, so luxury is uh, sheer luxury just because somebody else doesn't have it. Um, I think something like gold is a fairly good example. The fact that gold is rare means that it's, it's a luxury compared to other metals. Uh, but then we can also think about luxury as a term that could actually be common. Um, so a sort of luxury that applies to everybody. Um, one of my favorite examples is just like really nice bed linens. Um, <laughs> Plausibly, yes. you know, plausibly we can all have luxurious bed linens. Yes. Um, and I, I think that's a really important distinction to be made, though, is that, you know, when we are talking about luxury, we have to be aware that we're not talking about luxury premised upon uh, hierarchy, but something that's actually uh, for the commons. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I had a similar thought thinking about the term luxury, which I've otherwise not thought um, that much about, and that was that it, it tends to function within our society. Um, as a kind of term of distinction, that is say, something that somehow signifies prestige, and it's something that's both experienced and, and also kind of exhibited in some way, and, uh, and it kind of marks you know, some kind of social, uh, some form of social domination or hierarchy or something like that. And so that's really the question, I think, on some levels, is what kind of transformations the term would undergo um, with a kind of transformation of social relations and social property relations. Um, like the other a display. Pardon? Like a display. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And uh, maybe display would function a bit differently as well, right? I mean, I'll just say it's, it's not something that one uh, displays in order to uh, differentiate one's access to this or that sort of right. you know, use value. So, um, and the other thing was simply that um, I think the term luxury would be defined to some extent um, by the type of society one lives in, right? And so we would have to sort of imagine what kind of world that would be. And if it's a world in which, for example, work is largely replaced by machines, which is one fantasy that people have uh, about the future, then luxury might take the form of a certain kind of work. Let's say work that's done by hand, work that's done collectively uh, with your friends uh, and uh, neighbors, or work that's done slowly and which affords the possibility of error and that sort of thing. And so I was thinking a little bit in those terms too, but that would be defined by a specific world that one shares with others and not uh, be a kind of abstraction um, that one would sort of define over against something like need or something like that. So um, that's sort of the, the thoughts that I was having about this term. But, yeah, so. um, and luxury for all is a pretty specific slogan right. that is, I can't remember what the group's name is, but it's um, 
It's an automated communism slogan. Can you give some context to that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, at least in Britain, there's this idea of a fully automated luxury communism. Um, and this is, I think it's a really great phrase because uh, it really upsets standard notions of what communism means. Um, so when we typically think about communism, we have this idea of like gray, bland, sort of like everybody working hard and not enjoying anything. And that I think, you know, that's, that's the image, particularly in America, that's the image of communism that we have when we think about like the USSR or something like that. So to call it luxury communism, uh, I think really upsets that notion and all of a sudden we're starting to think, well actually, um, what the hell does luxury communism mean? It's, it's clearly not something like that, that gray bland world. Uh, so it's a useful term, and I think actually it gets to really the heart of what Marx was actually talking about. And this was, you know, Marx's relationship to capitalism was pretty, I don't want to say ambiguous, but he recognized the positive aspects of capitalism as well. And for him at least, the capitalism developed the productive forces of society that enabled us to get beyond scarcity. And for him, communism was only possible once we had those basic level uh, of wants that could be satisfied. So I think luxury communism is actually what Marx was talking about. It was a point when we were beyond our needs, um, when we could have all of our basic needs satisfied and we could start thinking about other things. Now that could be material things, but it could also be completely immaterial, spiritual, whatever you want. Uh, but this is where I think luxury communism is. It's useful as a political slogan, but I think it also gets to the heart of what Marx was trying to do. I'm just thinking about um, a conversation I had uh, on a panel, a science fiction panel uh, in uh, Boston where someone was, was trying to say that uh, creativity was a luxury. <laughs> and uh, the, the response from my co-panelist was, no, no, it's a need. <laughs> it's, uh, it does depend on, on the context, doesn't it? Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, this raises the issue of like the, the, the mutability of human needs, though. Um, the fact that they aren't like biological, they aren't just given, right. uh, they are historically constructed. I mean, the, John Maynard Keynes back in the 1930s famously talked about, we would all have a 15-hour work week by now. Um, clearly, it hasn't happened. And part of the reason why is because our needs have changed. We didn't need to have a smartphone 20 years ago. Uh, now it seems almost like a, a necessity to have a smartphone. Um, but yeah, this, this sort of ratcheting up of needs, I think, is also... Um, um, when we want to talk about luxury, we have to take that into account as well, that there is no rigid definition of what counts as a need. Um, that, I feel like that ties really nicely into a question I had later, so I might ask it now just to jump on the moment. But um, Nick, in your book that you wrote with Alex Williams, you talked about or Inventing the Future, the book was called. You talked about the idea that automation or automated labor can liberate people from work mm -hmm. to pursue whatever luxurious idea they have. Um, and then in your article, Nowhere to Go, you, um, you wrote about how over the course of more than a century, the demand for labor has also grown exponentially. And what we saw was people, um, when automation closes sectors, people jumped onto new emerging sectors or new emerging industries. Um, do you think automation would make work obsolete? And then if it would, how do you make an appeal for leisure in a time when people sort of pride industriousness as a form of self-worth, like what they you were just do. talking about? <laughs> they really we can do. complain about that too. <laughs> but before that, I'm gonna get my water. Would you pass that water bottle up on the So I, I think in response to that, I think the, the, the point is that automation could liberate us from, uh, I don't wanna say work actually, I wanna say it liberates us from wage labor. Uh, because I think a lot of what we do in our free time and what we do as a hobby and what we enjoy could be termed work in a certain sense. Um, if you decide that like, you want to go and study philosophy, that, that takes a lot of work to read Hegel. Um, if you want to like, you know, pick up a musical instrument and learn that, that takes a lot of work as well. So I think really what we're talking about when we talk about automation liberating us, it's not from work, um, but it's from wage labor, this period of time, eight hours a day and often more, where we don't have control over our own time, uh, where we're told what to do and what we have to wear and how we have to behave. Uh, and this is what I think, you know, the, the promise of automation really is, is the, the liberation from that sort of control. Yeah, I mean, I, I just add to that, I mean, the, the, there's also, 
work that's unwaged in our society. There's a great deal of work that's unwaged in our society. And to some extent, one of the great struggles that uh, the women's movement and feminist movement have uh, sort of articulated over the course of not just the last 40 years, but since the late 19th century was to somehow industrialize, uh, let's say, reproductive labor, whether that be childcare, whether that be uh, housework, actually. There's a great Angela Davis article uh, on the, the, I guess it's called the obsolescence of, of housework from 1980 or so, where she has this kind of idea, which, which is, uh, dates back to the 1880s, uh, really, with people like August Babel and, and Friedrich Engels um, and others, that one has to sort of organize and socialize uh, at the social, or excuse me, the, uh, to organize at the social level housework. Uh, and that means both to socialize it collectively but also to sort of industrialize in some way housework. And there's lots of ways one could talk about that in terms of how that's unfolded within the context of a capitalist society the last uh, 100 plus years. Um, one, th one thing I, I would also um, mention here is that, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Like, uh, that's just I'll, a footnote to what Nick said um, as well. I mean, the one thing to think about, though, is that automation in the context of a capitalist, uh, within the capitalist society and capitalist mode of production has never meant, nor has it been intended to reduce the amount of work that people actually do. Uh, it's meant to increase the rate of surplus value. And that's a totally, I mean, it's a kind of a technical issue, but basically what it means is that it reduces the amount of necessary labor time that people actually have to perform during the work day in order to reproduce their own existence. And what that does is it increases the amount of surplus labor that they actually give for free to, uh, to capitalists. And so that actually can uh, have different, you know, sort of, uh, uh, effects, let's say, but but it's never been a matter of reducing the amount of work as such. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just sort of would throw that, that's the second sort of point I would just throw out, so. Yeah. Um, no, I, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm thinking uh, totally in terms of science fiction stories. <laughs> By all means, well, quite useful. Uh, I can ask you a very specific Okay, sure. Well, like to bring this back to um, Utopia, and I was thinking about your very popular book, Everfair, um, where you reimagine the history of the Congo, where um, the people of the Congo um, discover s steam technology. They do. Uh, th there's some bio stuff going yeah. on there, too. And Yeah. yeah. But, um, but like sort of that revisionist history sort of reminds me of that really famous William Gibson quote where he says the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I think about this current conversation where people um, have these ideas about liberation and luxury and what it would mean for people to be liberated, but of course not everybody is in that conversation. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the role of history. Um, like what do you see as, where do you see the role of history in utopianism and while there is much focus on shaping the future, can you talk about how in your own work, um, political strategies may take in the form of re-narrativizing the past? And I'm sure you can. Oh yeah, um, actually one of the most important things I learned last year was that time is actually a lie. This was something that, that I learned from uh, another science fiction writer, of course. Um, <laughs> and, and that we, um, and, and that a lot of what she was talking about was re-narrativizing the past. Um, that um, you look at what happened and you look at it differently um, and that you tell the stories from different points of view. Um, the the uh, utopia that my characters are creating is not a utopia for everyone. It's not. They would like it to be, they think it is. Um, but the Fabian socialists, and the uh, African-American missionaries and the indigenous population, they all have different ideas of um, what, where they came from, what they're doing, how they got there, and how they're going to um, move forward after, after they defeat Leopold. Leopold is defeated halfway through the book, so then they have to construct their nation and, and place their nation in history and, and that sort of thing. And there, there's a very deep struggle between the narratives, uh, uh, the narrative um, strategies that they employ. So that's, which fortunately, um, well, I won't spoil everything, but fortunately it does not uh, devolve into an armed conflict. Uh, it does not end that way. Slippernet too. I love that story. 
Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, Slippernet is sort of a sequel to an unwritten sequel to Everfair. Um, I was asked to, um, to write a science fiction story set in the current administration. Um, so um, the premise of the sequel to Everfair involves uh, something called the Wood Wide Web. It's uh, trees have a root uh, system in, in involving um, fungi, and they communicate with each other. They redistribute um, resources and um, that sort of thing. So um, in, in my sequel, um, people are, are using that to create sort of empathy networks, and um, this is revived in Trump's America. Um, and it's actually sort of forced on some people. <laughs> Uh, I think the headline for the story was, um, how ethical is it to weaponize empathy? <laughs> yeah, maybe not, but we'll do it anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know what else I should say about that. That's, it's short. It's a sequel to a non-existent book. Um, it involves a technology that hasn't been invented yet. Well, I think the connection I made there with like the the force of empathy, which I thought was so brilliant, was like people. I think if you ask anybody, people say there should be more empathy. Just like maybe if you ask everybody, people would say everybody would benefit from more free time. Um, and uh, it also reminded me of that Harrison Bergeron science fiction short story that I think is like a dystopian tale about socialism where Kurt Vonnegut wrote it where like yes. everybody has these enforced handicaps so that everybody can be equal but they all hate it obviously because they want to like have natural talents um, but to, to rope this back into automation perhaps um, it's like if you I've also read studies where like people because of unemployment or underemployment do have free time but don't necessarily want it like what do you have responses to that yeah, I think this is, you're absolutely right. The most studies, when you look at like unemployed people, um, they're depressed. Uh, they've got um, mental stress. They've got physical stress. Uh, it's, it's pretty abysmal. But I think the really important thing to note is that this is unemployment under a capitalist system. Uh, this is a system that demands that you work, that demands that you find a job, uh, lest you starve on the street, lest you go homeless. So I think quite obviously, if you're unemployed in, under a capitalist system, free time is not going to seem all that wonderful because you're going to be constantly worrying about how to find a job. Um, I think that's quite different once we change the social context and change the conditions because free time could be liberating. Free time could be a time to um, spend with your family, read Hegel, do whatever you want. Um, I don't know why I keep talking about Hegel. I don't even really <laughs> like him. Hmm. <laughs> Everything leads back to Hegel. I think Foucault said that. Um, but no, so I mean, the free time could be something which is quite positive, but I think we have to recognize that it's not, it's not intrinsically positive. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, my, my periods of unemployment have been miserable and terrible, trying to figure out how you're gonna make rent and how you're gonna pay for food. Um, so yeah, but I, I think we have to be aware of that when we look at those sorts of studies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people at work are also miserable and depressed. <laughs> like, uh, and I, I think that um, particularly the, the the types of jobs that are uh, the, that are um, the rate of growth of the jobs that are growing at the fastest rate, not in absolute terms, but in relative terms, tend not to be jobs that are uh, particularly sort of uh, you know that one can affirm easily one's role uh, in the in society or the world, um, and that tends to be people also kind of miserable. Um, so it's a complicated thing, right? I mean, because on the one hand, I think that a lot of people, if they had access to uh, social production, that's say some form of uh, access, whether it be through money or some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of socially uh, produced um, form of mediation that allows them access to the social social production. I, I don't think work would be such a significant question, and the difference between employment and unemployment wouldn't be so relevant, at least in terms of their own uh, relationship to the world. Um, and so it's really a question of the fact that people are 
dependent on markets to have access to goods to reproduce their lives. Um, and they need money to do that in this society. And um, so they have to go find work. And the kind of work they can find is not particularly uh, enriching for most of them. I mean, literally, I think in our society, we're talking, you know, well over, you know, 60, 70% of the work that people do uh, is not work they can, uh, that they feel somehow like enriched or otherwise fulfilled by. Um, and so I think that's a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a structural social malaise that, um, that's not uh, only sort of psychological, but something that's kind of like built into the world of work um, today. So, so yeah, I think it's really a question of not having money is the issue. Like, uh, <clears throat> Would you say not no access to goods and services that are produced socially? Well, I'm I'm thinking of of uh, people that I have encountered who did not who, who had no pressure of of uh, poverty. They were collecting whatever benefits they could. They were supported, and yet they still had somehow their sense of worth tied up in in earning it. Right. Yeah. Why? Right, which is a strange. Strange thing, right? Like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think we all want to have you know a kind of role in society that's right. somehow enriching, and maybe uh, that's something that's kind of built into the world we live in. But um, de facto, the jobs that we have access to often aren't ones that will, you know. I mean, maybe earning it's important, but maybe there's something like uh, doing work that's somehow um, relevant in some way. Um, socially relevant or productive in some kind of like some, very narrow Something that Marxist changes the like world a, or? Yeah, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Like, um, yeah. I mean, I think th these are kind of structural questions, right? So people's experience of those, of those structures is, is can, can vary, but, um, but oftentimes I feel like these questions of worth or value or depression are, are kind of <laughs> built into a kind of set of conditions that we all have to live rather than um, particular situations, you know, so. Something like that, I don't know. I'm gonna ask you a question about race. Um, there's a lot of worry that automation of labor will intensify racial and geographical disparities. Um, and in your essay, Nowhere to Go, you quoted James Boggs, mm -hmm. um, the black auto worker um, who portrayed a lot of his life and work at the Chrysler plant in Detroit and documented um, even during the struggles for um, between workers and employers, there were a lot of racial class yeah, yeah, clashes sure. too, um, and including hate strikes that were organized by white workers. Um, how do we address the structure, structuring forces of racism in imagining alternate futures? Um, I mean, I'll just say something about James Boggs. I mean, James Boggs is a really interesting figure, uh, and um, you know, he wrote this book on automation in 1962, right? And so this is kind of a long-standing, it's actually quite cyclical, the kind of fears that both, uh, you know, capitalists but also workers have about automation. And of course, workers experience automation in a very specific way, meaning that they think their work is going to be uh, taken from them by machines. Uh, and one of the things that, that Boggs, but also many other uh, black workers and black militants have pointed out is that there's a kind of structural or de facto um, threat to black workers in particular, uh, this is again 1960s when Boggs was speaking, but also throughout the 60s you have similar types of discussions where um, there was a perception that, of course, the to back up a little bit, there was these something called hate strikes in the 40s uh, at, at, the, at Packard um, in particular in Detroit where white workers in particular were, were upset by black workers integrating uh, the production, in, 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 integrating production. And of course this is, this is because there's a kind of, uh, sense of a kind of competition or division within the class um, that's sort of articulated along racial lines. And so what Bogg says is essentially that um, there's this experience that when automation is introduced, what that does is it produces a kind of division uh, among workers between a kind of elite that will become a kind of managerial kind of oversight group and those workers who were hired last and therefore fired first. Right. And those, are, those tend to be articulated along uh, kind of racial lines. And so that's the experience that he was sort of looking at. I think a lot of other people, again, in the 60s were saying the same things. It's like, it's not that black workers were targeted per se, but it just happened to be the case that black workers, the ones who were, uh, because they were the last hired, or most recently hired, who would be fired first right. uh, due to, so that's one way to think about this question of automation, how it crosses uh, or intersects with this question of race um, that I was kind of interested in. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, the question would be, how would, that, how would that play out in the present? 
in a much more complex world of work than that world, so. Yeah. Well, I um, actually see this more um, playing out in uh, geographical locations. Um, specifically, I see quite a difference between my home uh, base in Michigan, which I go back to quite frequently, and here in the Northwest, um, there's just a much more um, a, a much more accepting uh, attitude in this area towards automation, perhaps because of that that history. So, um, so I, I definitely see it playing out that way. As far as as, um, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, how do we address the structuring forces of racism in imagining alternate futures? So in imagining alter alternate futures, um, uh, I, I, I insert myself. <laughs> I, um, I, I try and reflect uh, and extrapolate from the reality of, of what I experience now, which is not, uh, d does not exclude people of, of multiple racial backgrounds, it just doesn't. So um, my advice to anyone who wants to um, to do the same is expect us, because we're gonna be there. I, I think there's another aspect to add as well, which is um, uh, automation is disproportionately not going to affect just not only um, certain cities in America, but uh, differently across the world. Uh, so there's a very famous study from Oxford which says that 47% of current US jobs could be automated within two decades. Um, so you know, nearly half the jobs could be disappearing. Now it sounds really terrible, but then actually the World Bank did a study and they looked at how automation could affect um, developing countries. Uh, and in China, it's something like 77% of jobs could be automated there. Um, in Nigeria, I believe it was 65%. Uh, in Ethiopia, it was 85%. So the, the, the sort of effects of automation are not the same across the world. Uh, and they are disproportionately affecting low-income economies. Uh, the other aspect as well is what happens when jobs start going, um, when you're replaced by a robot. Xenophobia, you blame the immigrant, you blame the foreigner. Uh, and oftentimes this is dictated by the color of skin rather than anything else. So I think we need to blame robots and capitalists rather than foreigners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, this is, this is all we can expect to happen, uh, and I think we need to be aware of it and prepared for it because it's going to uh, exacerbate racial tensions, and we need to, to uh, prevent that. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I, those numbers are a little bit, uh, by some accounts, are a little bit inflated, like the 47. I just want to throw that out there, like um, that these numbers are, you know, they're kind of speculative, and we could, uh, we could sort of parse them a little bit, like, um, so. That's what I do in this, this little essay that I wrote for Brooklyn Rail. I, I try to suggest that maybe it's not 47%. Like, uh, and I'm, I'm just citing someone else. I'm not doing the work. You know? <laughs> so. I'm trying to think of what that connects to. Well, Nisi, to go back to um, your, your work doing the, the restructuring, um, one of the biggest tropes in science fiction is take is using alternate history in critical ways that foreground real issues such as colonialism and globalization and um, dominant culture. And you're, you're really interested in the, the political work of writing science fiction um, and redefining technology to include social technology such as yes. you, you cited um, Kim Stanley Robinson. Can you talk a little bit about what that work means to you? Sure. Uh, well. Um we both thought of it. I mean, I, he got to talk about it uh, at a speech he gave at WISCON, which is a feminist science fiction convention. Um, is he, he was, a science fiction writer? Yes, he is. Um, primarily, that's pretty much what he does. He's also a baseball fan and stuff like that. But yeah, that's how he... You have Don't define hobbies. him just by his job. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but he, he's, he um, pointed out that uh, the problems that we are going through um, can, can be solved by technology as long as you give a very wide definition of technology. Um, and my idea that um, there is an African American tradition of uh, social technology derives from my understanding that 
when you come here with nothing but your social uh, awareness, then that's what you have for a technology and that's what you use to change the world. So, um, so, so politics is a social technology. Um, education is a social technology. These are all things that we use to change ourselves and to change the world. And um, w we really can't discount their importance and we can't, I, I'm part of a move to, movement to um, to pump up their value uh, among science fiction writers. Uh, to back up a little bit, if you're familiar at all with science fiction, there is a sort of a dichotomy and a hierarchy between what is hard science and what is soft science. And hard science supposedly relies more on technology. So my response is, this is technology. My being friends with people and having families and working together, having a union, that's technology. So. Can I just ask, why, why the term technology to describe the, or to somehow characterize those? Uh, because it's, it's a tool that you use to change um, your perception of the world and therefore, to my mind, changing your perception of the world changes the world for you and for anybody else that you are um, able to, uh, to, to uh, draw into your perception. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I just, I, it seems like the term is a kind of a contested term and so you're trying yes. to reclaim the term in some sense Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> away from other forms, but I can imagine other people wanting to sort of shy away from the term, so that's why. I yes, guess. well, and um, the entire speech that, that Stan, as we call him, Kim Stanley Robinson gave on this um, was, uh, ha has been reprinted in Wisconsin Chronicles, so. Um, it is available if anybody else wants to see his much more um, detailed and uh, reasoned argument about how social uh, tools are also valid as tools. I think it's a great time to have that conversation too now because we're in like the third third decade of the militarized internet or like ever since what you, you both are gonna talk about on Sunday of just like the idea of the internet as a social utopia um, that arose out of like the 70s Bay Area, right? And like people know that technology alone, technology as we know it with like a hard T isn't gonna solve our problems, but like what else would it take? Would it take social intelligence? And if so, in what form? Right. That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it is? <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a hard time sometimes figuring out what technology means, partly because I, my own limitations, um, but partly because I have a very narrow understanding of what that means, which is to some extent, it's something that's implemented in production processes to sort of augment labor productivity. <laughs> and so, so for me, like that, that's everything else I want to sort of uh, push is, I mean, I realize that the technology is used for all sorts of things like calling one's loved ones and watching baseball games and that sort of thing. Um, but I have this very, very, in, in terms of the social relevance of technology, I tend to think of it as something that's sort of embedded within kind of labor, the labor process and that it has very specific social effects. And so um, that's why, for me, um, reclaiming the term is really interesting, right, on some level, because it's something that um, is sort of posing one technology against another, um, a kind of social technology against a kind of anti-social technology, if you like, or something like that, uh, or a kind of um, destructive technological infrastructure and some, some other kind of living form of, of technology. So that's, that's why I, I sort of uh, bring the term up, because I... Um, and then the question of problems, I guess it depends on what problems uh, we have, right? I mean, <laughs> like whether technology can solve them, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm sure we could go one by one and look at all the problems and say, nope, yeah. not that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not this one. Um, but well, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I guess what I meant was like the internet in a way, like the people who invented it, invented it to fight fascism because they thought like information was coming from like all of these dominant like institutions. And if we had peer to peer communications, there would be a more centralized way of getting information. And obviously that didn't really work out the way they saw, like looking at that as an example. And now when you're thinking of inventing new forms of 
um, liberation or like social connection, like what could we learn from stuff like that? And I guess to me, it does have to do with socializing, like you were talking about, but I, I'm just not sure how, and I was wondering if you had any more thoughts on that. It's okay if you don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe to sort of take it to riff off of that, but I think um, uh, this issue about like social technology versus the more sort of narrow definition of technology, in, in a certain sense, when we look at something like Facebook, we can see the sort of um, the almost physicalization, the embodiment of uh, what is a social technology. So the rules of interaction between people and between groups of, uh, uh, groups of people. Um, we see that now on Facebook. And, you know, there's only certain ways that you can interact. Uh, we've now got six options to respond to, you know, uh, to a comment. <laughs> um, but, you know, th those rules are there. They're embedded. They're quite, uh, they're embedded within the technology, within the programming. And I think that um, it sort of makes explicit in a certain way the, 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 the social technology that's already there in operation. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of what we can learn from the, short of, the sort of move from this public internet that was designed to be something for everybody um, to something which is becoming increasingly privatized and increasingly centralized and controlled by a handful of companies, I think the real lesson to learn from that is that capitalism is very powerful. Yeah. Um, capitalism can take almost anything that we think is pure and you know, for the common good uh, and turn it into the exact opposite. Uh, we see this with open source stuff, we see this with, you know, um, with music which should be free, but you know, you're streaming and paying for it. Um, I think these are all lessons to learn that we can't just, well, they're, they're lessons to learn about the limits of technology by itself. Uh, these technologies by themselves are not going to do anything unless we also change the social conditions. So I think that's one major thing to learn from it. There are um, technologies that, um, that arise in response to that sort of thing. Um, I am a member of a group of friends who currently have a Facebook page. Uh, we're currently a, also a, a secret Facebook group, but we're going to migrate from there. Um, we call ourselves the Progressive Nerds Network. <laughs> And um, w yeah, we um, used one form of, uh, of uh, Facebook, and, but we're not relying on it, and we're going to leave it. Um, and, and, That's what and, we all say, right? Like, uh, no, no, we're not actually, relying on it, and we're going to leave it really soon. Like, uh. Yeah, because, because we, we are already creating our own. Right, well. So. Your own Facebook? <laughs> it's, a, it's a secret group. <laughs> oh yeah, I am. And the only reason I'm on Facebook is because I was working for um, Clarion West Writers Workshop and um, as part of my post I had to um, create a group, a, a group for the writing workshop on, it was, it was job related, that was basically it. So. I think I have time for one more question, and it is how much capitalist infrastructure can be repurposed? <laughs> um, a nice, easy question. Yeah. Oh, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, I think um, 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 Jasper Burns has a really good take on this, um, which is just that it has to be a sort of case-by-case -case sort of thing. Uh, there's no easy answer to say whether or not a technology can be um, used under communism or not. Um, although I think, interestingly, there are examples of technology we have now that we could say would not be used under communism. And my favorite example is call centers. We would just abolish call centers. <laughs> um, they serve no purpose except to annoy and make profit for a couple of companies. Um, so let's get rid of them. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about, and this is sort of related to, you should always, uh, I guess, I forget the name of the, the text, but Jasper Burns' text, it was in the third issue of EndNotes, and it's kind of a wonderful uh, essay on logistics technology in particular, and the capacity for a kind of, uh, let's say, a kind of a socialist or maybe a communist kind of repurposing of that, te uh, of that technology. What would that look like, or is it possible, that sort of thing? And it's quite technical in a lot of ways, but 
I was thinking about an example um, of this just-in-time technology um, and the kind of uses it's put to in the contemporary moment. And I, I was reading about this recently. I don't know if it's true. I just read it somewhere. Like, um, but essentially, th there was this idea that, that um, recently it had been made legal for chickens to be, uh, I guess, raised in the US, shipped across the seas to China to be processed and then shipped back to the US to be sold in, in American markets. And clearly the only reason that's being done is to take advantage of wage differentials, right? That they can be processed by workers in, in China at a, at a fraction of what they would, it would cost to do that in, in Iowa or wherever the hell the chickens are raised. Um, and that's a kind of example of a kind of technology that exists only for the purposes of the capitalist valorization process, right? It has no other function except to do that. And in the process, of course, it destroys you know, the, the earth. Uh, you know, sort of trip by trip. And so that's a kind of example, I think, uh, of, of a sort of technological innovation, um, which is to some extent a kind of signature innovation of the last 40 years, this kind of um, just-in-time technology that sort of involves like logistical networks, uh, containerization, and that sort of thing. Um, and the way, and the kind of uses that is put to. And, um, and I, so the question is, what, what, would, what would it mean if that's the, purpose of those technologies in the contemporary social uh, context, kind of global context, what would it mean to even think about putting those to use in another context uh, when they exist solely to, uh, to exploit wage differentials? So, um, I mean, of course, we, we'd have to think about certain technologies and that sort of thing, but we also need to, you know, even in a kind of purely theoretical sense, if we look at sort of like, you know, Marx, let's say, um, I mean, Marx, when he talks about, um, large-scale industry, he says that what you, what you see as, as one moves progressively from cooperation to manufacture and division of labor to large-scale industry is an increasing kind of imbrication of the labor process and the valorization process, which is to say use value and exchange value to use the, the kind of primitive categories that the book begins with. And so what that means on some level is that, that large-scale industry becomes a kind of form of production which is in some sense mirrors capitalist social relations. And that's, when one gets to that point, there's the question of what it means to repurpose a technology becomes more and more, uh, you know, sort of difficult, uh, but both theoretically and abstractly, but also in terms of the material uh, process whereby one would do that. And so um, that's the thing that's really interesting to me. I don't think it's yes or no, but I do think it's a, a kind of, um, uh, I think we had to take into account all these realities of what, what this stuff exists for, you know. Um, so, yeah. I, I'm thinking of a poem that a, a friend of mine wrote. Um, David Finley wrote a, a poem called I Stole the Torturer's Tongue. Um, <laughs> yeah, because um, you, there are people who say you can't actually write anything um, in, in a colonial language that will, will uh, will upset the, the uh, power structure, the colonial power structure. And he more or less uh, disagrees with that in this poem. Um, yeah, so I, I think that it is possible. Also, I've been sitting here with this book in front of me, which I'm gonna wave in the air now. It is not my book. It is um, by Cory Doctorow. It is called Walk Away, and it is about repurposing um, a ton of different kinds of technologies and systems that are um, that were invented uh, to further capitalism, and then of course capitalism being so pernicious as it is, um, they, they um, this is contested, and, and um, it's a a very optimistic novel about uh, that struggle and the outcome. So I w I recommend it. Uh, uh, in terms of um, thought experiments, which is pretty much what science fiction is, uh, in in the uh, in the area of um, repurposing capitalist technology. It's interesting that it's called walk away. Yeah, yeah, it's because it like maybe walking away. Like, it is <laughs> uh, in, in in quite a different a uh, few ways. Um, walkaways are people who have walked away from. Society and it's also uh, areas that um, capitalism um, seeds to the walkaways oh, okay. and right. yeah. So, so it's I, a noun and a verb. <laughs> I think we're taking questions, but I'm not sure in what form or if people are just free to raise their hands. Um, I didn't have a question, but I, oh, 
I uh, guess that's what we're... Up to the microphone and... Yeah. We do have a question. There's microphones on either side of the stage, and uh, please remember to keep your question in the form of a question. <laughs> so, uh, I had a question, which was regarding um, the use of rare earth mining for mini electronics, especially um, uh, quote unquote green electronics. Uh, if we aren't to to ruin the planet, how can we? Um, how can we replace this rare earth mining and still find a way to keep our um, to, to keep our machines, so to speak? Um, yeah, it's a really like crucial question, I think, for any sort of um, fully automated future, uh, particularly one that's not going to like kill off the environment. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One is, first of all, we have to think about like fixing the labor process. So uh, the sort of working conditions that people labor under to get these materials is often some of the most abysmal on earth. Um, so fixing that labor process is a, a first thing. Um, another thing is simply, uh, it's possible to find synthetic replacements. Um, so some of these minerals are, uh, rare earth is sort of misnamed because not all of them are actually rare. Uh -huh. um, but some of them are rare, and scientists are building sort of synthetic replacements to think about how we could do it in different ways. Uh, the third option is uh, a much greater attention to recycling. Um, and not just recycling in a general sense, but actually properly thinking all of the electronic waste that we produce, how do we use all of that stuff to build the next generation of technology uh, without having to get it, get it out of the ground or um, just leaving it as a sort of toxic waste. Uh, from a science fictional point of view, if you want that, um, the, the, what I've seen mostly is, is a focus on uh, changing the labor process, as in um, automating it and, and uh, keeping it from, from impacting people's lives. Uh, again, um, there are a lot of people who um, think of the extraction in terms of um, remediation. Um, you have certain uh, plants which extract the, the uh, rare earths and then you harvest the plants. But we just make this stuff up, right? It, it hasn't actually happened yet. You also might not be able to keep your machines. That's the other. Uh, that's the that's option number six. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you no know machines. Like a... oh. uh, two quick questions. One, has anybody ever been subject to a blacklist or had to sign a loyalty oath? Number one. Number two, why do we relegate democratic socialism to science fiction and utopian thinking? which most of the world actually practices. <laughs> no, I've never had to sign a loyalty oath. Not yet. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've neither written science fiction nor uh, signed a loyalty oath. So. <laughs> But I, I think on the utopia question, I think it's, um, it, it's an element of, of communist thinking from the very beginning. Um, the imagination of a better world, something comple uh, completely different uh, from what exists now. Um, that's not to say that it's unattainable, but I just think that it's an element of um, going beyond what we consider possible at the present moment. Yeah, I mean, th there's always going to be a kind of horizon of struggle, right? I mean, like, that's articulate in different ways. And I guess Utopia has a certain kind of legacy, which is quite uh, distinguished uh, and old at this point. Um, but I, I think that separating, I, I don't, so do my own relationship to politics be democratic socialist or whatever the social democratic or whatever the term would be. But, um, but nevertheless, I, I do think that it's very important to sort of be able to articulate a kind of horizon of struggle. And I think to some extent that's not always going to be a fiction. I think it's something that emerges within struggles themselves as people begin to, articulate uh, the meaning of those struggles. Um, but I think that utopian thinking is, is, is probably a part of that uh, as well. So um, I don't think it's something that can be separated from, or shouldn't be separated from uh, kind of real material political processes or social processes myself, so. I'm, I'm really having trouble with the word relegated. Um, yeah. Right, I mean elections could be thought of as a kind of 
funny fiction that we also participate in, right? Like uh, we, we go through this kind of strange ordeal for what, two years and, and suddenly, um, you know, we end up with what we end up with, so. I also have uh, two questions. Um, uh, first of all, I, I was uh, wondering um, what your thoughts are on the con possible connections between uh, the rise of mass incarceration and automation, um, whether mass incarceration is a response to automation, as many theorists have argued, um, and what to do about that. And then secondly, um, I've, I've often thought of, or I've, I've had conversations with coworkers and neighbors who are worried about being replaced um, and that sort of that xenophobia question coming up that you're mentioning, and I've, I've said things like, um, the problem is robots, and robots are whiter than all of us. <laughs> and I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. What race are robots? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the real question, of course, is what race are the owners of the robots, and you're absolutely right there. Um, on the mass incarceration and automation thing, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think you're probably right. Um, I think... You well, I was going to say, more. I mean, there's, a, there's this book by R Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is uh, called Golden Gulag, which to some extent takes this into account, but I don't think the term is so much automation, which is a very, uh, again, uh, my, you know, I say something about this in this, this article. I mean, it's a, there's a kind of cyclical fascination with the term automation, and it's from the 30s, from the 60s, early 90s, uh, with people like Jeremy Rifkin, uh, and also today, and the term uh, will probably kind of fade or kind of... Uh, lose uh, its relevance, you know, in the next four or five years as people move on to other things. But the term that she uses is deindustrialization, and maybe that's a better way to think about it because that what that means to some extent is a lot of work is being kind of automated through uh, some kind of very complex mechanical processes, usually in manufacturing uh, or agriculture, of course. And what that does is it pushes people out of those. Uh, branches of production into into the service industry primarily, but um, that can be a very very fraught terrain. Um, and so I think that, I mean, I, I wouldn't say more than to simply say that maybe the term de is deindustrialization, which is maybe something we think of as kind of unfolding in kind of a high income, in the high income countries, as they sometimes put it, uh, like places like the US, since the 70s. Um, and that um, automation might be a kind of way of avoiding thinking about that kind of longer term process. But but Ruth Wilson Gilmore's book is really fantastic. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know if anybody knows it, but it's, it's uh, she's the foremost sort of expert on this question, I think, so. I mean, that's, I don't know, the question, your, your second question, I'm not sure, but that's, that's what I was thinking. Institutionalization of, of, of some sort. Um, I, I have seen um, the sort, same sort of uh, question uh, in terms of uh, schools. You know, is um, compulsory school uh, and and the uh, lengthening of the school life uh, is that a response to automation? I can remember I can remember very clearly being five years old, being told I was going to go to school for twelve years. <laughs> I think, no, no, I have stuff to do. <laughs> they can't. So, so yeah, it, it, it's the same sort of thing. You've got to warehouse the people somewhere. I, I just want to say that next Thursday night at Inca Institute, Jasper Burns will be talking about his new book about deindustrialization and particularly how it affects the work of art. It's very interesting. And Jasper, as uh, Jason pointed out, is, of course, a theorist of logistics and uh, a very bright guy. So. Uh, come and look it up on the schedule the 11th of May. Yeah, so uh, I, I work on a uh, Internet of Things platform that is rapidly leading toward the complete automation of drivers, uh, particularly in industries like trucking and whatnot, which employs a massive amount of folks, right? And uh, so I can tell you from internal meetings that um, one of the things that we never do is consider uh, what this means politically. Uh, it's just all about the technology, right? And that's because we're being good capitalists in that sense. Like we're just driving toward, uh, there's this rate of tendency of profit to fall, and we're just driving toward increasing profits, which is reducing driver's wages. Uh, f completely, that's the entire goal, right, is to, to get rid of that primarily. But I think there's this second thing that comes from the power of that, right? Like there's a lot of, lot of power to that automation, but one of the things that really strongly concerns me is that when you automate something like that, what you do is you completely reify and literally codify 
uh, decision-making processes that up until now humans have made. And one of my concerns is that out of automation, what we have is, is, is I think, in capitalism in general, we've had this, this tendency to reduce subjectivity to nothing but conscious experience. And I think that this really drives to reduce subjectivity to nothing but sheer capitalism. And this point where we have nothing but algorithms deciding what happens, we've completely gotten rid of p the pure contingency that allow that's allowed for event and history to move forward. I was just wondering uh, if there's any concerns about that in terms of automation. I mean, I, I think one sort of interesting way to take this is um, um, the, the late Mark Fisher wrote a lot about the nature of capitalism and its effect on our mental health and our, our mental states. Uh, and I, I think it's not a surprise that, you know, the rich countries also have a huge amount of drug abuse. And it's not, it's not the 1960s, you know, sort of escaping and experimenting sort of drug abuse. It's, it's survival drug abuse to get through the day. Uh, and that is directly correlated with the, the nature of the capitalist system and the way in which it structures our life. Um, and I think, you know, Mark's point was always that our mental health is not an individual issue. It's a socially produced issue and that we need to be aware of these sorts of things. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that capitalism is sort of trying to drive us down to that sort of base level of existence and we're responding in, you know, better and worse ways. I have nothing to So I find that discussions of automation often focus on its effects on mechanical, physical, sometimes intellectual labor. And I'm wondering, like, as that has happened in many sectors of the economy in this country over the last few decades, we've also seen a widening realm of emotional and effective labor in the service sector, in care work, things like childcare, um, care of older people. And that work is also often feminized and yeah more likely to be occupied by people of color. And so I'm wondering how you see automation affecting emotional and effective labor, and if you feel that that labor is less vulnerable to automation, and if so, does that make it a weak point in current capitalism? Of course, I've seen um, tons of stories about, uh, about machines doing emotional labor. Um, in caretaking, um, that is that is one of the realms that that science fiction is exploring, um, because we're all we're all believing that we can come up with something that is like AI that that comes very close to passing what they call the Turing test. So, um, not not tomorrow, but maybe next month. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, um, care work is really hard to sort of uh, automate. Um, and I, I think the expectation actually is that, um, I think increasingly we're all gonna be forced into care jobs. There's a couple of reasons why. One is um, because it's not automatable, so humans still have to do it. Uh, but we also have aging populations. So we have an increasing number of people, elderly people who need care in some form. Um, people are living longer lives, so they need care for a longer period of time. Uh, which means that healthcare is by far the biggest job growing sector. Uh, I think it already takes up like 13% of the economy in terms of jobs, and it's gonna be growing significantly. So I think it's interesting because you're absolutely right, it's been feminized and it's been racialized, but there's gonna be an increasing number of people pushed into this sector, and I, I don't know what's gonna happen with that, but it is a very interesting question. I'll give you one sort of negative example though, which is Japan. So Japan has, you know, the, the elderly, the uh, el, uh, oldest population uh, in the world. Um, and they also have, are starting to use a lot of robots to take care of elderly people. Uh, but when you start to look into the details of it, you realize that why they've been developing these robots and stuff is because they don't want foreigners coming in and taking care of elderly people. So they'd actually prefer robots rather than a foreigner coming in. They're and they're wider. <laughs> yeah, so this is, I mean, there's this really interesting, like, mixture of xenophobia combined in with automation, and yeah, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in any particular country, but this is, like, one of the outcomes that we might see. Yeah, I, I think that that question's absolutely to the point, and I think that that's, that's really the, 
the question automation poses is that, uh, you know, the service sector, particularly this type of service work is going to expand massively and, uh, and it's going to be a low wage sector. It's going to be a sector in which people are not working in big workplaces where they can organize themselves and collectively act, but it's going to be in people's houses, you know, they're going to be alone in someone's house. Um, and I think that uh, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, when they gave the, the top 10, um, from 2014 to 2024, the, the jobs, the top 10 jobs that will grow in relative terms uh, fastest over that 10 year period, the top, the first was personal care aid, which is a very open ended uh, notion, but it tends to have a kind of uh, de-skilled healthcare aid type of uh, profile. And then the third was home healthcare aid. And that's first and third. Um, and the fourth was fast food. So, you know, kind of very low paid restaurant work. And the, t and the top 10 uh, jobs, I think eight, seven or eight of them had no formal educational requirements uh, necessary, right? So it's entirely based on this kind of personal care work uh, uh, attention that's um, not uh, something that can be somehow made more efficient through technological, uh, you know, the, the kind of technological mediation. And so I think that's what the labor market's gonna look like. Um, and it is going to affect primarily women and women of color, um, but it's also increasingly a, a large uh, part of the labor market. Um, I mean, because in manufacturing, you're talking literally four or 5% of the population that work in, work in manufacturing. Uh, I mean, agriculture is like 2%, right? Um, and so you got about 80% of the, the workforce is working in, uh, in the so-called service sector. And within that sector, of course, there's people who work in finance and stuff like that, teaching. But there's a massive amount in healthcare, and particularly low-wage healthcare. Um, and that's the, that's the labor market. And we're talking $18,000 a year, $20,000 a year that people are making, not 45, not 65, not benefits, it's 18,000, so. But, but it is actually quite organizable. Um, have you heard of SEIU? Um, sure. And, and uh, I actually have worked as a home health care worker, personal care right. worker, um, and that's a very good, very strong union, actually. Um, uh, I, I mean, comparative terms. I mean, I'm mean, talking about like sit-down strikes. Let's say in 19, late 1930s at, in, in Flint, you had you know 10, 20, 30 thousand people acting in the same place at the same time. What I'm saying is that the workplace itself may not be large, but there are ways that that these people that we interact and and form our own organizations. Right. No, I I totally and I think it's necessary. I'm just I'm just. I'm just suggesting that if you're if your workers are spread out uh, and kind of isolated in individual it's homes, a different that it's, way it's, of it's a difficult. It's a little more difficult to uh, to organize. I mean, that's historically been the case. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, uh, like I was thinking about. Um, well, yeah. So yeah, I, I totally agree that it's necessary and it will be increasingly necessary. It's just that the historical pattern has been that people organize most effectively when they work in massive workplaces. Uh, that um, in which their the work process is is somehow articulated by um, uh, yeah anyway I, I will stop there but but that's the I mean I think that's the labor market so I promise this isn't a speech but it may take me a while to formulate the question especially because I think part of my question has already been answered so I'm thinking in terms of the luxury of avoiding catastrophic climate change that, you know, that could could damage or destroy sustainable societies. And um, I'm also thinking of Naomi Klein's recent book, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And of course, she talks about repurposing the energy system. And she mentions uh, jobs that are both not not easily um, offshored. And uh, and and also low climate, and she, but and she talks about things such as such as teachers, and um, and health workers, and uh, and even government officials who do things like protect um, uh, human health workers, and gosh, even keep uh, corporations under control and make them better neighbors. So. Um, with, with with that as sort of the preface, could you could you um, elaborate on what you see as a, oh sorry on repurposing technology uh, to be uh, more climate friendly? 
I mean, I think one way to sort of take this is to say, um, it's another good example of a technology that can't be repurposed, something like the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and I think in these sorts of circumstances, the, the only option um, is to, to stop it, um, to stop pipelines. Because their only purpose is, again, to extract oil and burn it and produce carbon. Um, so, yeah, that's something which absolutely serves no purpose. And, um, yeah, uh, in terms of repurposing, I don't think it necessarily applies. Although I have to read the Naomi Klein. I haven't read it yet to see what she says, but... Yeah, yeah. For everyone, it really makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, it, I, it has an element of science fiction for repurposing the energy system. I, I uh, just wanted to show you, I, you could take this. I have these postcards for um, an anthology called Sun Vault, Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation. So, um, there, there's actually like a little subgenre of uh, stories about um, making new appropriate technology that's that's uh, well, that's less um, unsustainable and uh, repurposing current technologies to make them more sustainable. There's actually a bunch of us want to do that, so postcards if you want. They're blank, so you can write anything you want on them. Hi. Um, really quick observation in terms of social technology, a fun example I always like to give in events like this is that this like format of a panel discussion is like a really salient kind of social technology that we all kind of sit in rows and listen to a panel discussing and ask questions in this way. Yeah. Um, but uh, my question was kind of a, is, is about the political sort of near term of a lot of these questions of luxury communism. Uh, this week, I saw Cory Booker endorsing, vaguely endorsing universal basic income in, in a weird way, which is sort of the latest in these sort of odd neoliberal co-optations of universal basic income and its popularity in sort of tech bro culture uh, is another example of that. And I think that in, on the one hand, that's kind of cool because it represents like a sense that capitalism is, knows that something needs to be done but on the other hand is risky in terms of the broad politics of sort of leftist utopian progress. So if you could comment on that and address how we sort of fight that co-optation. Anyone on the panel? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the sort of fascination uh, with UBI amongst the, the tech bro sector, um, it, it, it's another simple solution. It's almost like a technological solution to a, a massive social problem. Um, and I think this is, I mean, b both amongst the proponents and the opponents of basic income, um, I think it's a real problem to present it as a magic bullet that's gonna solve all of our issues. Uh, I think we need a much broader package of changes to be able to think about proper solutions. Um, but the other aspect as well is that when somebody from Silicon Valley is talking about a basic income, what they really mean is let's get rid of any elements of the welfare state uh, and replace it with, you know, just a lump sum of money given to people. Uh, and I think it, people on the left, even if you don't necessarily agree with the basic income, we need people on the left making a case for a UBI on top of the welfare state and targeted benefits and universal childcare and universal health care and all of these sorts of things. Um, I want all of that and UBI, <laughs> which is maybe utopian, but hey. Um, but no, but I think we need to be making that case. And the, the only way we're gonna fight off the sort of Silicon Valley approach to basic income is if we are making this argument. So I think we need people to be doing that and not just give up on it and. Um, let Silicon Valley have the idea. Yeah, I'm surprised that Cory Booker, of all people, um, uh, was coming out uh, in favor of UBI, but I think Hillary Clinton was speaking about automation. Okay. It was like very 2020 hot during that time. All right. It also reminds me of your most recent book, Platform Capitalism, too, of this idea of like Silicon Valley co opting. Mm -hmm. Um, like ideas that people, like grassroots activists have had when you talk about the co-opting of collectivism in the sharing economy, for example. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's another good example of, of the ways in which capitalism can turn something which seems quite genuinely good and common into something um, horrible. 
Um, I mean, it's interesting, the sharing economy, the sharing economy, the first thing that uh, was part of the sharing economy was um, couch surfing, couchsurfing.com. Uh, and this was, you could just share your couch and travel, uh, people traveling around the world. It was entirely for free. It was just a nice community of people. And Silicon Valley comes along and completely ruins it. Um, but this is, yeah, I think it's just something we have to be wary of. And it doesn't mean that these ideas are necessarily bad, but it, it means that we have to be aware that they can be co-opted and placed into another social situation. So we only have time for about two more questions. Hi. Um, so it seems that the last 50 years of technological automation and advance has only increased wealth disparity. And what you describe as the labor surplus has mostly been disproportionately enjoyed by a narrowing elite. And when we think about the appeals of the that surplus, like they're only going to get better and better. They're going to be recreational trips to space in a lifespan of 150 years. And I really want to know why and how you think that that trend is going to reverse and somehow the future of automation is going to increase wealth equity, especially when it comes to free time or maybe things like healthcare, because I can't imagine it. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> you can just walk away from wealth. <laughs> I mean, I, I think one answer is just simply to organize. Um, I mean, we need to Im imagine new ways to organize, imagine new ways to work together. Um, we have the numbers, and we have the power if we manage to work together. Um, it's not easy. There's no technological solution. There's no simple solution. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but regardless of what we want for the future, we have to be organizing and working together um, and doing events like this and discussing ideas. Um, that's not an easy pat answer in any way, but I think um, that's the only solution. Yeah, and I, I would also say that, I mean, one of the ways to think about the, you know, this kind of stagnant uh, real wage of workers over the past 40 years and this kind of disparity and uh, you know, the kind of all the gains, all the profits or, uh, or all the whatever growth that's uh, occurred within certain lines of production has been, you know, the benefits of that have been recuperated by um, the owners of that, um, uh, of the corporations or whatever involved, is that, is that there's deep within that, there's just some kind of deep sense of like a kind of crisis um, of capitalism that can be kind of like sense, and I think that, you know, there's this idea that all this talk of automation gives one the sense that, that the contemporary capitalist uh, economy is like really super dynamic and kind of innovative and that sort of thing. And I think that to some extent, that's not the case at all. Um, I think there are certain kinds of technologies and certain kind of hype around various technologies that give one the sense that maybe there's a kind of dynamism. But if you actually look at um, work done by lots of people, and Nick's uh, new book, the first chapter, deals with this at quite some length, dealing uh, in particular with Robert Brenner's work, is what you see, in fact, is a kind of declining profit rate uh, in capitalist economies globally since the 1970s. And when you have a declining profit rate, what happens, or one response, particularly if there's not actually a lot of innovation despite the rhetoric, is wage suppression. And, um, and so to some extent, that kind of those stagnant wages are a kind of symptom of a kind of deep uh, kind of structural crisis that's kind of unfolding within the kind of global capitalist economy. And so I think that we should, we should put the rhetoric of automation and the kind of implied dynamism um, in brackets and sort of look at uh, the kind of capitalist economy um, as being kind of largely stagnant and that the, the game is basically to suppress wages and, and uh, create you know, profit margins through that kind of uh, direct uh, suppression. Um, whereas a kind of dynamic capitalist economy would be one in which you have massive growth, uh, huge profits, and some kind of profit sharing relationship with labor. And you'd say, look, your wages are going up, our profits are going up, we're expanding uh, at four or five percent a year, isn't this great? And, um, and that's what happened for, you know, a kind of couple decades after the war, but that's not what's happening now. And I think that, um, uh, so should we, we should, it's also a question of, you know, it's our ability to theorize and organize in that context, but we also have to take into account that that's the situation and the class dynamic is shaped by that. 
uh, that the, the crisis of the capitalist economy to some extent means that workers are weakened rather than strengthened um, and that the class dynamic is one that's in some sense is the inversion of what you might expect. A weak capitalism can mean a strong dominant class. Like, so, um, and, but nevertheless, there's a structural issue. There's an objective reality that's kind of unfolding um, that we have to sort of account for um, and sort of put to the side a little bit the, the rhetoric of um, we, you know, the moonshot rhetoric of uh, the tech world, so. One more question, over there. Uh, to immediately bring you into moonshot rhetoric, <laughs> space is a place. It's like as far away as Canada. Um, <laughs> it's has a lot of interesting features, like it's full of rare minerals. It has a lot of land that, as far as we know, is not occupied by indigenous populations and it's really a place that robots are good at rather than squishy human-bodied people. Uh, is space the place? You need to talk to my friend Eileen Gunn. Um, Can I have she, her number? Um, no, but I'll give you her email address. <laughs> I, guess, I guess is space the place for, for what? To solve capitalist contradictions? I, I don't think so. Um, I, yeah, I mean, this is, is this is sort of a, a, yeah, is it capitalism going out into space or is it humanity going out into space? And I think that that's a really sort of like important distinction. Um, if it's capitalism going out there, it'll probably just be robots mining asteroids, bringing back trillions of dollars of minerals, um, literally trillions, it's a huge amount. Um, but that's not benefiting really humanity in any way. That's just perpetuating this economic system we have um, that means most of us suffer while a handful of us get massively wealthy. Yeah, isn't it, is it the Peter Thiel or whatever his name, the kind of fascist guy? Like, um, isn't he the one who said that uh, you promised us space and we got Twitter? Wasn't it? Isn't that like, uh, <laughs> or flying cars or whatever, right? I mean, the idea is that like, you know, in the 60s they went to the moon, you know, we get uh, Amazon Echo or whatever, you know, like uh, it's like, <laughs> Like, I, I, you know, they should, they should uh, you know, follow through on these things a bit more. Like, uh, like Let's take one more question since this is Red May and it's a festival month. Satpreet, why don't you come up and ask? Yeah. Um, yeah, as the only visible femme of color who came up to ask a question, I'm just going to take this space anyway, even if you hadn't said that. Um, but, yeah, earlier somebody had said that robots are only as white as the people who make them. Similarly, I completely agree with that sentiment. And similarly, when I look around this room, I see that the communities who could most benefit from an anti-capitalist, utopian, ideal future are the communities that aren't in this room because they are under-resourced, underpaid, overworked, and therefore they don't have the luxury of like theorizing, writing about, and discussing these ideas. And so when this future is being talked about and written about by a select group of people, do you think it's possible for it to be a future that could work for everybody? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's just me writing about what the future should be, no. Um, it has to be a massive discussion amongst a wide group of people. Of, um, it can't just be a bunch of white men telling us what to do. Um, as much as I like my own opinions, you know. Yeah, in my experience, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't see. There's a lot of lights in my eyes, like uh, so. I don't know. But but my experience is that uh, I, the people who do, uh, the people you describe, do often. At least this might be my my friends. Uh, theorize their condition quite a bit, uh, both in kind of like, you know, sanctioned forms, the kind of academic or whatever, um, but also in other forms as well. And I don't, I wouldn't want to uh, deny those people um, their ability to, to theorize uh, their own situations. I find that particularly the case uh, in the experiences I've had in Oakland, um, uh, as well as in LA. So I'll just, I mean, I take the point, tr trust me, uh, I know the point very well. Um, but I also want to want to say that uh, I don't think that the people on this panel or people like me or like us uh, by, all me by any means are um, solely responsible for kind of the theoretical work and theoretical production that's going on in this country and, and, uh, 
and elsewhere. I think it's happening uh, in struggles, and the people who are struggling are the most uh, capable in some sense of actually producing intelligent uh, analysis of their, their situation and the larger situation. So that's my experience. It might be uh, not universal, but that's, that's, um, that's my response. There are so many more people of color writing science fiction these days than there were five years ago. I mean, really, it's, it's really changed. So if you're looking for that kind of um, imaginative leap into, into what the future can be like, then you can find it in science fiction. There's, well, maybe not millions. There's, there's uh, dozens of us in it. <laughs> And no, seriously, like, like five years ago, there were two. So, so it's really, really um, a change. I want to add to, like, I totally agree that, like, automation is a really white intellectual sport. And also Seattle is super white. So, like, those things compounded, you're going to get a room full of white people when you talk about, like, leftist political strategies. Um, and, like, this writer in Seattle named Sean Scott, he is constantly, did you just clap? <laughs> is he in here? Um, but he's constantly writing about and bringing to light people of color and black people who have been socialists in history and like, like kind of um, dispelling the myth that it's, it's been a white intellectual sport and, and even like James Boggs. Well, James Boggs is a right. perfect example. Yeah, and I think like the work that maybe white writers can do is like bring writers of yeah, color or theorists of color to the light to sort of pay homage to those people and and also, Nisi, what you were talking about with like including the definition of technology to include social technology of people who've built networks, which includes activists, writers, like Afrofuturists, um, like people doing Walida sci -fi work. Walida and Ad Adrian Marie Brown, and yeah. Right, and I think that's how we expand the field outside it being like a white intellectual sport. And you were mentioning Angela Davis too, yeah, right? Yeah, Angela Davis as well. Yeah. yeah. Well. I think this is a wonderful point to end the panel, which is only the first word in this discussion, which as we see has to be expanded to others. And we hope in a month that all communities will come and participate in what we're opening as only the kind of, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to talk about things that are not talked about, like Marx, communism, and socialism, and yet at the same time, recognizing the insufficiency of what we are creating uh, in this first effort at trying to create a monthly festival to that. So I think this is a good uh, moment to end and to say thank you to everybody for starting a discussion which needs to be broadened and needs to continue and, and ramify in many ways. And I'd, I would like personally to thank Min, uh, Jason, Nick, and Nisi for what I found to be a fascinating discussion, and let's give them a hand. <laughs> and I hope, to see, I hope to see some of you again at other events during this month, and thanks very much for coming. <laughs>